sad loss because he was not only a wonderful actor, he was a really wonderful man. He was a very good friend uh, uh, and genuinely a good man as well. He, he, uh, he helped people a great deal. When I, when I arrived in Stratford in 1985 to do this play with him, met him for the first time, he wasn't that well known. But, I, but he was already a sort of guru to other actors who, uh, mm. who would, would um, knock on his door late at night and ask him questions about... Uh, their, yeah. their craft, really. Now, I, I remember that play. I mean, it, it, it was sort of one of the big dramatic events of, of, of the 1980s, and it seemed as if it was tailor-made for Alan Rickman, but uh, obviously the book originally wasn't, but did you have him in mind when you wrote it? Well, I, it, it, the, the part was offered to another actor who wasn't available, um, and we were sort of racking our brains as to who to, to go to. And actually, my wife suggested Alan Rickman, who I'd always liked and watched at the Bush, and and the Royal Court, and it seemed a perfect idea, and I put it to the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they, uh, they brought him in to do a couple of Shakespeare roles as well in that season, um, and that was the first time I met him. You talked about his craft and how other actors would be knocking on his door. Daniel Radcliffe has said that today, one of the most supportive people he'd ever worked with in the film industry. Emma Thompson as well, saying it was the clarity with which he saw most things, including me. How did that help him, do you it, think? Well, it, 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 he, he was a very truthful man and a very truthful actor. So and that came out in the performances. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and he, he really did uh, go out of his way to help other, other actors, which is not always the case with actors. I, mean, I was lo looking at the clips we've seen today. I mean, it is extraordinary how slowly he speaks, how he puts in pauses. He, he takes a very banal sentence and makes something completely different. Yeah, he really was a unique... Uh, voice, uh, that wonderful sort of dark chocolate voice, he, 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 really, he really was like no one else. Um, and uh, uh, of course people cast him as villains because he could do that. Well you cast him as a bit of a exactly. villain. Exactly. Uh, but he could throw that sort of malign uh, shadow over, over, over the proceedings whenever he wanted to, but uh, that was very, very far from his, uh, you know, his persona. He was, uh, he, you know, he was a bon viveur, he loved restaurants, he loved friends, he was, he was a really kind man. Yeah, I mean, Helen Mirren described the voice as one that could suggest honey or a hidden stiletto blade. And that was the thing, wasn't it, that he, he was cast as villains, but there were also the leading male roles as well. Well, truly, he had a deep huge, deep yes, yes. huge army of, of admirers. Yes, well, he, he did, uh, he, he really struck people uh, in, a, in a particular way. I remember him showing me a letter when he was in Les Liaisons en Angereuse from... Uh, somebody who, had, who wrote to him and said, uh, could you explain to me why, uh, as an ardent fe feminist, I came out of that play wanting to kiss you? <laughs> and that was what Lindsay Duncan said, wasn't it? That, that people would walk out of the theatre wanting to have sex, preferably with Alan Rickman. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Other than uh, Liaison Dojo, what, what are your favourite Rickman roles? Oh, I loved him in Truly, Madly, Deeply. Um, but I, and I think he was sort of very unusual and, and, and uh, unforgettable in Private Lives and in, in the Noel Cow play, which was also with Lindsay Duncan, mm. where he, he wasn't like, you, you know, the sort of uh, clipped coward mm. uh, hero that we're used to. He, he really seemed like that, that, he really made that man real. You spotted his talent and cast him on stage in what's seen as his breakthrough role. and. Hollywood was very swift to spot that talent as well, wasn't it? Yes, well, they came. Uh, some of the producers of Die Hard came to see uh, Liaison when, when it was on Broadway, and that's how he got to the part in, in Die Hard. And, and it's hard to remember or imagine that it was his first role mm. in film because he's so authoritative and he's so, uh, you know, he's so at ease in that in that uh, playing that terrorist. And. It, I mean, I suppose he plays, tended to play grand, posh people to a certain extent, which again was a difference from, from the man in, in, in real life who didn't come to Yeah, that's right. Um, but he, it, it, I mean, that was really due to his people wanting to exploit his extraordinary voice. And he had a tremendous so, command of phrasing, so, you, you know, a he, very complicated long line. He would always pick out the right yeah. word to emphasize. Where did it come from, the voice? I don't know, it was just pure talent. I mean, I think, he's, I think uh, uh, he was Welsh. Uh, his parents <laughs> were Welsh in origin, and maybe there was some sort of musical uh, um, uh, talent that he had. But he, he really knew how to place a line as well as anyone I've ever worked with. 
When did you last see him? A couple of months ago. We had lunch, and he uh, he was looking a little drawn, but he seemed uh, very uh, happy. Just finished directing a film, and he was looking forward to uh, to doing to doing more work. And uh, so, which you know, very sadly, we're deprived of because ev ev uh, for me, every everything he did was worth watching. And like David Bowie, managed to keep his illness private and uh, yes. not not make an issue of it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Difficult of him. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.